Welcome to Brain and Vet. I am truly delighted to have one of my intellectual heroes on the show, Nadine Strassen, and we're going to be talking about free speech and hate speech. Dean, would you like to start with a real life case? Mark, it is such an honor to be on your show. I've really enjoyed watching it. There are so many real live cases about so-called hate speech. I won't use the scare quotes from now on, but always imagine that they are there because it is an inherently irreducibly subjective term, which is bandied about in my country, and I know in countries around the world, to stigmatize and attempt to suppress whatever speech conveys an idea that the user of that phrase hates. So in the United States, we've recently had very ferocious, understandably vigorous debates about abortion in the wake of the Supreme Court's, to some extent, shocking decision to overturn Roe versus Wade after almost half a century. Some extent shocking because the decision had been leaked, but I think many people were hoping against hope that the court might have second thoughts in light of the adverse reaction to the leak. Be that as it may, the conservative supermajority did decide to take away what had been a constitutional right cherished by generations of women. And this has led to very ferocious debate and accusations and counter accusations between the pro-life and pro-choice factions, each one accusing the other of engaging in hate speech, whether those who oppose abortion rights are accused of hate speech against women, those who support abortion rights are accused of hate speech, indeed genocide against what the advocates on that side call the pre-born baby. There was one particularly poignant example to me as a member of the legal profession, along with you, Mark, because I believe if there's any venue and occupation and education in which robust free speech, even for hateful and hated ideas, should be protected, it's got to be in the legal profession. And it has to be in the law schools where we are educating future lawyers and future advocates who should be prepared who have a professional responsibility to zealously advocate on behalf of all clients, including those who have ideas that are considered hateful. Certainly, I, with the American Civil Liberties Union, have a long tradition of defending freedom, even for the thought that we hate. So let me tell you about one really depressing incident at the American University Law School in Washington, D.C., a very prestigious private law school which therefore, because it's private, is not bound by the First Amendment free speech guarantee. Of course, that only applies to state universities, but along with virtually every private higher educational institution, American University has voluntarily agreed as a contractual matter to honor what would be constitutionally protected free speech rights if they had been a public law school. So first year law students had an online chat group in which they were vigorously debating the pros and cons of this decision called the Dobbs case. And one student on that chat group was a conservative evangelical Christian who said that as a matter of his religious beliefs, he thought that abortion was Im immoral as a result of his conservative political beliefs. He thought the Supreme Court was correct in overturning Roe versus Wade. But when other students strongly disagreed with him, not using any targeted epithets, but I think, you know, some fairly insulting general language, maybe they said that his argument was stupid, words to that effect, nothing, nothing more vitriolic than that. He basically accused them of hate speech and the law school, to its shame, initiated an investigation accusing him of engaging in so-called discriminatory harassment, which is the rubric that many educational institutions use to go after hateful and hated ideas. Hate speech codes were declared unconstitutional many years and many cases ago, but institutions try to work their way around it by reusing a different label, discriminatory harassment. Now, the bottom line is after a couple of weeks of investigation, which of course struck a very serious chilling effect into the hearts and minds of 
not only the students who were being investigated, but all others at American University. The university, better late than never, terminated the investigation. But it should never have been undertaken in the first place. In fact, from my perspective, even if the students had engaged in offensive and crude and not particularly professional slurs such as, oh, you darn, you know, backwater, benighted Christian, your religious views are stupid and ignorant. I wouldn't be proud of them as law students, but I would be even less proud of a law school that sought to punish them for engaging in that kind of expression. So then what is the right way to define hate speech? It sounds like it just means offensive speech to a lot of people. So if I'm offended or the group to which I belong is offended or should be offended by what you've said, then it must be hate speech. That seems to be how people are using the term, but is that the correct way to use the term? Well, you know, Jason, you're making me think of an incident that occurred many years ago when the very first campus hate speech code was adopted back in the 1980s and the American Civil Liberties Union brought a lawsuit challenging it. It's been a longstanding tenet of First Amendment law that you have no right not to be offended, or to put it conversely, we do have a free speech right to make statements that are offensive to other people. In fact, as the Supreme Court has said, free speech may be most worthy of protection when it's offensive, because that means it's going against the majoritarian grain. And the whole purpose of free speech is to protect the most unpopular and battled ideas and speakers. So the University of Michigan, which was the university at issue in this case, had used a typical definition of hate speech as coming up with other synonyms for hate is what it basically comes down to speech. But since it's focused on identity of uh, group identity characteristics, the synonyms tend to be speech that is demeaning or degrading or dehumanizing. And I've read the hate speech laws in many other countries, including yours, and they pretty much use the same language. So right off the bat during the oral argument, the lawyer for the university had to acknowledge that offensive speech is constitutionally protected. So the judge leans over and says to him, well, counsel, how do you distinguish offensive speech, which you agree is constitutionally protected from demeaning, degrading, or dehumanizing speech, which you're contending is not constitutionally protected. And the lawyer, you know, without missing a beat said very carefully, your honor, <laughs> which I think showed a great sense of humor, but it's really no laughing matter because what this means in practical effect is that whoever is enforcing that kind of code has pretty much unfettered discretion to pick whatever ideas they think are worthy of suppression. And what we were able to show in that case and what has been clear when one looks at the evidence of all hate speech codes and laws around the world and throughout history is that not surprisingly, indeed quite predictably, the ideas that are singled out for punishment under these discretionary loose standards are ideas of minority individuals, minority groups, and certainly of minority political perspectives, which is why so many human rights advocates in countries around the world have said, you know, we oppose the idea of hate speech codes, not because of any abstract concern about free speech. The laws in most of their countries do allow that speech to be punished, but specifically from the perspective of what is an effective way to counter hatred and to promote equality, inclusivity, and diversity for those groups that have traditionally been marginalized. These laws are, no matter how well intended, are at best ineffective and at worst counterproductive. So you're right to say that a lot of hate speech law takes aim at merely offensive speech. And in my day job, I do a fair amount of work on the, dif the difference between constitutionally protected speech and speech that falls beyond the protection of our constitution in South Africa. We have a limitation, which is that if you advocate hatred on the grounds of race, gender, ethnicity, or religion, and it constitutes an incitement to cause harm, that speech is not protected. And it seems that there's something different when the speech itself calls for third parties to mm -hmm. perform an action against the targeted mm -hmm. group. 
as opposed mm-hmm. to merely saying something that targets the group. In other words, using a racial slur is different from saying, go out and kill those people. And I wondered if you think that there are fair limitations on speech and what those limitations ought to be. That's a really excellent point, Mark. And I'm looking for an introductory quote in my book on hate speech because your excellent question really gets to this point. It's quoting a statement from what I believe was the first treatise on free speech law in the United States written by a Harvard law professor named Zechariah Chaffee in the first half of the 20th century. He was one of the founders of the American Civil Liberties Union in 1920 and a great defender of free speech. So he wrote this a long time ago, but what he says is still true and it's true for your country as well as mine. He said, the real issue in every free speech controversy is this, whether the state can punish all words which have some tendency however remote, to bring about acts in violation of law or only words which directly incite to acts in violation of law. And in the United States, we used to have, I would say before the 1960s, a so-called bad tendency test that any speech which might indirectly at some future time perhaps lead to harm could be punished. As Oliver Wendell Holmes said, every idea is an incitement. You know, everything that we're saying could probably lead somebody to commit some horrific act. And I'm not really exaggerating. What Holmes meant, of course, is we're not going to punish every idea, but we have to limit it, limit government's discretion to punishing only those which have a really direct and immediate connection to serious specific harm. And the test that we adopted in the United States after the bad tendency tests is stricter than yours, as you know, although yours is on the spectrum, I would say it sounds, you know, more demanding than the bad tendency, but less demanding than the Brandenburg test, which was adopted unanimously in 1969 in a case that was handled by the ACLU and not only the ACLU, but our lawyer from the national office on that case was Eleanor Holmes Norton, an African-American woman who for many years has been the representative of the District of Columbia and Congress, a really fervent advocate of civil rights. And back then and to this day, she continues to believe that defending this principle, which happened to be in a case involving a leader of the Ku Klux Klan who could not have had more antithetical ideas to hers than to the ACLU's on civil rights, but that ultimately this was going to benefit advocates of civil rights and human rights. And so Clarence Brandenburg, the Kent Klan leader in that case, made a speech in which he advocated revenge and violence against Jews and Blacks, and mind you, he used very different words to describe both groups and said revenge would have to be taken. He was brandishing a gun. And the Supreme Court unanimously said that even advocacy of lawlessness, even advocacy of violence is protected under the Constitution. What is not protected is only, and there are many different requirements, intentional incitement, as distinguished from advocacy, of imminent violence or lawlessness, which is likely to happen imminently. Prior to that time, we had tests that involved some of those elements, but not all of them. And when I see how removing one of the elements endangers speech that is really important to human rights advocacy, I would be very reluctant to back away toward the more government deferential uh, standard that you have in South Africa. Uh, Let me give you a really specific example. It was a recent ACLU case that we had in the Supreme Court last year in which we were representing D. Ray McKesson, one of the major leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement. He was at a rally against police abuse and, you know, he was firing up the crowd against police abuse and defund the police and these other slogans. And in the commotion that ensued, 
somebody who has not yet been identified threw a rock and injured a police officer. That police officer sued not only McKesson himself, but also the Black Lives Matter movement for a huge amount of damages for injury to him. And even though there was absolutely no evidence at all that McKesson or the movement even knew who the person was, he was actually held culpable by the federal trial court and by the federal appellate court. The ACLU represented him on the appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And we argued that under the Brandenburg standard, which should have been applied and was not applied, he, of course, could not be held culpable. The U.S. Supreme Court kind of dodged the issue. They tried to avoid a constitutional issue if the case can be decided on narrower grounds. So they sent it back to the state courts in Louisiana and said, you know, we think there's a fair claim that this didn't even satisfy the tort law standards for liability. So maybe we don't even have to reach the First Amendment issue. But in other words, you know, many of my liberal friends get all excited and they think maybe we should loosen the Brandenburg standard so Donald Trump could be held liable for incitement on January 6th for having fired up the insurrection. And as you know, there's great zeal to do that in my country at this point. But I always have to remind people, well, be careful of what you wish for, because if the standard is loosened up for Trump, it's also going to be loosened up for the Black Lives Matter movement. So on the left, there's been a movement towards redefining the term violence. So it's one thing to define violence in terms of physical harm to another human being. Uh, I don't know if that is the correct definition, but at least involving physical harm. Mm -hmm. But the left has started to talk about certain terms just mm -hmm. being uttered within my ambit as causing mm -hmm. me violence, microaggressions or slurs causing sort of emotional violence. If we redefine violence in that way, then maybe the Brandenburg test gets passed by a lot of speech that, that is under contention. Oh, that's such a devious argument, Jason. You're absolutely correct. I mean, there is so much rhetoric, which recently, I don't know if you saw this, entered actually the United States Congress, where Senator Ted Cruz was questioning some witness, and she didn't like a point he made. I think she accused him of being transphobic, but she equated his expression literally with violence. So these are ideas that started in the university and have spread way beyond the university. And in addition to the harm that Mark and I were talking about, the harm of uh, potentially instigating a third party to engage in discriminatory or violent conduct. That's certainly a serious harm. But Jason, there's another kind of harm, which is the direct emotional and psychic impact that words definitely have with proven physiological impacts. And those of us who defend free speech, I think, are the most aware of the potential of words to do harm because we are the most aware of the power of words. Words are powerful. That's exactly why we defend them. And as with all tools that we human beings have, they can be used for great good and they can be used for great harm. The reason, and you know, in my country, one of the cliches about free speech that is incorrect is, well, we have to distinguish between words or expression, which are protected and conduct, which is not protected. To me, that's a false dichotomy for many reasons. I mean, for one thing, a lot of conduct has been correctly treated as expression that is subject to protection under the First Amendment, whether it be marching in a parade or demonstration or burning a flag in protest or wearing an armband. So the fact that it's conduct doesn't mean that it's not protected. Conversely, the fact that it's words doesn't mean that it is protected. If the words have a sufficient connection to imminent harm, including physical violence, then they should not be protected. But the really tricky question is when we're talking about other kinds of harm other than the physical harm, the psychic and the emotional harms are real, but so are the harms of empowering government to punish speech solely because it causes psychic or emotional harms. Again, it, it seems to be a principle 
that is limitless. I mean, think of the dizzying array of really important speech that can cause psychic harm. I mentioned Donald Trump. I have a lot of friends who were deeply traumatized when he would make a speech or pain for office or insult the press. I mean, I had friends who literally suffered clinical depression and would have to go to bed and have to take an antidepressant. Or, you know, say you have a professor who dares to give you, or an employer who critiques your performance on a class project or an employment project. That can be deeply wounding and upsetting. You have a lover who breaks up with you, also deeply depressing. I mean, the list goes on and on. The even important speech can be very hurtful, but the Supreme Court has recognized that there may actually be a direct correlation that political speech tends to be particularly vituperative and arouse strong passions on people's part. So we would endanger the speech that is most important, not only in terms of individual liberty, but also in terms of our democratic self-governance. And let me interject a statement from the U.S. Supreme Court, which I know applies in your country as well under its form of government. The Supreme Court has said that speech about public issues is more than a matter of individual self-expression. It is the essence of self-government. So when Donald Trump says something that may put my friends in a depressive state of, you know, needing medication and psychotherapy, that is really important for our democratic republic, especially for people who want to vote him out of office, right, to be able to hear that speech. So I think, you know, what I often say to people is, yeah, speech can cause really great harm, but even more harmful is empowering government to punish that kind of speech because the power is going to be used in ways that are very inimical to ideas that you find positive. And, you know, another analogy I often think of is Winston Churchill's famous aphorism that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. So, you know, free speech for speech that causes emotional trauma is a really bad system except for the alternative of empowering government to suppress speech on that rationale. But you're the philosophers. I should be picking your brains about these kind of philosophical issues, the harm of free speech. So one of the rationales that you provided for why we ought to provide a wide array of speech to people is that minority groups in particular are often targeted by censorial laws. So in your book, Defending Pornography, you talk about how Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon had lobbied for really strict rules on pornographic materials. And some of the first books to be banned under their laws were their own books. And that often you have anti-gay sentiment that'll be used to censor certain kinds of pornography or certain kinds of speech. So one way to kind of avoid this problem, the critical race theorist might take the view, well, that's because you think that equality before the law matters. And you've said what's good for mm -hmm. the goose is good for the gander. Well, let's just do away with that. Mm -hmm. Let's just say that only speech, which is uttered by powerful groups, will mm -hmm. be targeted to sanction, and speech uttered by minority groups will not be subject to sanction. So mm -hmm. if you're gay or trans or you're black, mm -hmm. you can say whatever you like about the powerful people. Call them to be killed, no problem. If you're white and you're male and you're straight, well then shut up. And we don't have to worry about these minority groups being, you know, suffering under the yoke of our oppressive laws. We just won't apply them equally. Mark, you know, that's not a hypothetical in the sense that it has expressly been advocated. So the early advocates in chronological order were all law professors, all minority law professors. Richard Delgado wrote a key article in 1982, followed by Mari Matsuda and followed by Charles Lawrence. Um, and at least two of them expressly acknowledged that all laws are disproportionately enforced against members of minority groups. They acknowledged that had happened with respect to hate speech codes and was likely to continue happening. And therefore, these codes should be enforced only on behalf of traditionally or historically disempowered minority groups or words to that effect. And the first time I heard that idea, I was literally doing a live debate with Charles Lawrence. And my reaction on the spot was, well, 
you know, what do you do if you're talking about a, a gay, white woman and a straight, black man? I mean, given just the practical problems, given the intersectionality of different forms of hierarchy and oppression would create just a quagmire. I think that would make that kind of law unenforceable. A plus, there's another practical problem, and that is, you know, disempowered in what specific context? Would it be the immediate local community? Would it be the state? Would it be the nation? The reason I ask, for example, one of the most famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, cases the ACLU ever handled regarding hate speech was the Skokie case, which took place in Skokie, Illinois, a town near Chicago, with a large Jewish population at the time of the case in the late 1970s. The town included a large population of Holocaust survivors or very close relatives of Holocaust survivors. And the speech that was considered hate speech was speech by neo-Nazis. Now, in the town of Skokie, given the dominance of Jewish people and even the dominance of Holocaust survivors, who had no problem persuading the town government to quickly pass laws that stifled speech by neo-Nazis. They clearly had political power. Does that mean that it's the Nazis who become the disempowered minority in that context? So I think it's really an unenforceable concept. And obviously, it is completely anathema, not only to principles of free speech, but also to principles of equality, which I think ultimately we're only going to have free speech for me if we also have free speech for thee. And that was exactly what Eleanor Holmes Norton, who I mentioned earlier, the Black woman who was the ACLU's lawyer, not only in Brandenburg, but she represented a couple other white supremacists. And to this day, it's very proud of that work. She says that they were the immediate beneficiaries and their ideas were the immediate beneficiaries of the particular rulings. But in the long run, she knew that the major beneficiaries were actually civil rights demonstrators who at the time had ideas that were seen as hateful and dangerous in the segregated communities where they were seeking to demonstrate. And they were able to use these precedents to advance exactly the opposite views. So I think, you know, interestingly enough, the strategic points and the points of principle really are mutually reinforcing. One of the advantages of words is that they have meanings. So it's often not too difficult to get at what the meaning of an utterance is, although there will always be debate and there's questions around the meaning as it's interpreted by the listener versus the meaning as it's intended by the speaker. But those sort of issues we can kind of wade through in a lot of cases. But one of Mark's cases that he's worked on involves the flying of the old South African flag. So the old South African government was an apartheid government that endorsed a system which was deeply unjust and oppressed black people in horrendous ways. And there are still some South Africans who want to fly that old South African flag. And the question is whether that flag constitutes hate speech and should be governed by the same laws that we would use to determine whether certain types of speech should be censored by the government. Do you think speech and symbols or other forms of expression should be governed by the same rules, especially given that it's quite difficult to interpret what a, a symbol means in the way we understand what words mean? Very interesting question. And we face the analogous question in our country with Confederate flags that some people say that they fly because of reverence for Southern history, for respect for their ancestors who died in the civil war between the states, but which many other people see as a symbol of white supremacy, given that the Confederacy was fighting to preserve its peculiar institution of enslavement of African Americans. I think you raise the much more general question, which is really important and very much debated in the United States, Jason, and that is in order to punish speech, whether it's waving a flag or whether it's uttering words or any other kind of expression, should the intent of the speaker be relevant? 
In other words, would it be a saving factor from punishment that the speaker had a benign purpose in engaging in the expression? Those of us who are on the free speech side tend to insist on intent. Note that was a required element in the Brandenburg case. Whereas those who are seeking more government power to punish speech, including on college campuses, argue that even the most benign intent is not enough to save the speech. If any listener is subjectively offended by the speech or even by, you know, a misinterpretation of speech, that's enough to justify punishing it. Let me give you a really dramatic example, which is happening all over the United States. It is now clear that it's not safe for anybody, even for the most important, laudable, anti-discriminatory purpose, pro-racial justice purpose, to ever, in any context, utter a certain word, a certain racial slur. And I'm not even going to use the euphemism because a law professor has been fired for even using a euphemism for a positive purpose of presenting a very realistic case study involving racial discrimination in the workplace in which, surprise, surprise, that word was used. But professors have been punished even for having students read Martin Luther King's famous and brilliant letter from a Birmingham jail because he uses that word at least two times. It may even be three times. I hope it goes without saying that he uses it not to endorse it, but for exactly the opposite reason. And the professor assigning the letter certainly had anti-racist motives, but students are saying there should be no exceptions, just a categorical ban. And that demand is being made in law schools that students should not be required to read, for example, the Brandenburg case. As I mentioned earlier, the word that was used for Black people was not Black people or African Americans. And students are saying they shouldn't have to read that case because it exposes them to that word. So I don't know the factual details of the Black case, but my presumption would be strongly in favor of protecting the right to convey an idea. Well, you know me. I would even protect the right to advocate white supremacy, loathsome as I consider that viewpoint myself. But if people have those views, I want them to air them so other people can get out and counter demonstrate and rebut them. I think you point out that there's an enormous value in knowing how much appetite there is for distasteful ideas. So in a country where you're disallowed from waving the swastika, we don't know how many people have an appetite for neo-Nazism. In South Africa, you are allowed to wave the swastika and it happens almost never. And when it does happen, Jewish organizations are able to address that speech. They can speak to the individual. They can ask them why they were doing it. They can invite them to Holocaust and genocide centers and they can have discussions with them and educate them about what happened during the Holocaust. And you get a sense of how big the appetite is, how much attention should be spent combating hatred. Officers often make the point that they want to have access to that kind of information too, precisely so they can monitor the individuals to see if there are any conspiracy plans afoot or plots to engage in actual violence. And if you drive these people underground, it becomes much harder, A, to subject them to differing perspectives and debates to try to dissuade them, and B, to monitor and hopefully prevent them from engaging in actual discriminatory or violent conduct. Yes, you're losing out on free information, and that seems like an enormous pity. The other thing that happens is that you change the meaning of the symbol. So it could be the case that we would know with certainty that anyone waving a swastika was pro-Hitler and wanted to have another Holocaust. But if you ban the symbol and people start waving it, then the question is, are they waving it because it's a protest against restrictions on speech that actually they don't like censorship and that's why they're waving it. So now we've muddied the meaning of the symbol and that creates its own difficulties. You make me think of another example from a campus, my own alma mater, Harvard University. A while ago, students were flying the Confederate flag out of their dormitory room. They were students from the South. I have no doubt that they were showing, you know, their proud identity in this new home. They were first year students. And some other students, however, saw that as a hateful white supremacist symbol. And so they had a facing window. And they flew a flag with a swastika for exactly the reason that you surmised, Mark, 
to, to convey the message that, you know, we see that Confederate flag as tantamount to fascist Nazi speech. But other people obviously looked at the swastika and could see it as advocating genocide and, and fascism. So one of the objections to the view that you're getting free information about people who wave these <laughs> hateful symbols and so you should allow that to happen because you want to be able to convince them otherwise and because you want to be able to track their movements or their whereabouts. One of the objections to that view is that, okay, there might be some good that comes of that, but the negative that comes of it could also be that they convince people on the fence. Mm -hmm. So people on the fence who wouldn't sway that way, maybe now are swayed that way by the waving of the symbol and take on those ideas themselves, which wouldn't have happened without the waving. You know, it's really interesting to me, and I've asked social scientists, is there any way that we can empirically demonstrate that the dangers of free speech outweigh the, the benefits or whether, as is often asserted, but I don't know if it can be demonstrated that, no, the most effective way to counter negative ideas is not through suppression, but rather through persuasion, through counter speech. There is a lot of anecdotal evidence, but I don't know whether any of this is susceptible to empirical demonstration. In Europe, the, you know, one can certainly say that very strong laws against hate speech which are very strictly enforced, do not correlate with societies with an absence of hatred, including hateful and discriminatory violence and other conduct. I was starting to say the European countries have very strict anti-hate speech laws, which are by and large very strictly enforced. And yet, as we know, there have been distressing epidemics of not only hate speech, but also hateful, violent, murderous conduct against Jews, against refugees, against immigrants, against other minorities. And I recently did a debate against the EU commissioner. I call her the EU censorship czar. She would call herself, you know, something to do with protecting minorities. So I pointed out all of these statistics about, you know, the rise of distressing hateful crimes in Europe, which has been acknowledged by those who enforce the anti-hate speech laws. And her, and so my conclusion is that the laws don't work and therefore let's get rid of them or, you know, ramp up the counter speech efforts. Whereas hers is, yeah, the laws don't work. So therefore we need more laws and stricter laws. And in all fairness, I don't know whether there's going to be empirical uh, proof one way or the other, or whether it's ultimately a matter of where does your presumption lie? And that's ultimately what I come down to, that in a free society, and I guess for you as an anarchist, Jason, this would be even more true, the starting point is absence of government power to restrict what would otherwise be an individual liberty and something really essential to democracy as well. And I would also contend really essential to equality, that we all have equal rights to express our views, regardless of, of how loathsome other people might find them. And that government has the burden of proof to restrict those freedoms. So unless government can demonstrate that the restriction is going to be effective in promoting some really important goals, such as retarding discrimination and discriminatory violence, then the status quo is in favor of free speech and against the restrictions. I think the anarchist, because the anarchist doesn't want a state at all, doesn't want any state intervention in people's speech. And to many people, that sounds shocking, you know, especially when you look at the most egregious cases. So, you know, suppose you've got a case that satisfies the Brandenburg criteria. So someone walks in and gives speech that, and I'm going to list these criteria incorrectly, but mm -hmm. basically re results in violence. It was intentional. It was imminent. Mm -hmm. And it, all the, all the check boxes happen. And then mm -hmm. the anarchist says, but hold on, I don't want that kind of speech censored by the state. Perhaps that sounds so shocking because there's another side of this coin, which isn't being expressed, which is the anarchist still wants to say it's immoral and that mm -hmm. perhaps it would be the obligation of other people in that situation to stop that speech from occurring. It just, those other people wouldn't be an authority. They wouldn't be the state. So 
what the anarchist does, it relocates the question from mm -hmm. the legal question to a moral question. Mm -hmm. And the anarchist can still have views that certain speech is immoral, just without saying that government should preclude that speech from happening. Understood. Very interesting. And thank you for giving me an, a persuasive argument that I am not indeed a free speech absolutist, although I consider that a compliment. <laughs> so growing up, one of my favorite American imports was Mad Magazine. And I've got a little printout from 1971 of a modified American flag. Uh, I see the bottom line, right? <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. That sounds like Lenny Bruce. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's an interesting space for parody and, you know, it plays with this notion of inclusivity while using these despicable words. And that's where the comedy lies and that's where the truth lies. And it's interesting that this use mention distinction has collapsed, that in order to try and illustrate a point about why one ought not to use racial slurs against people, when someone uses the point illustratively, not at someone, they are nonetheless fired. <laughs> Um, and it's, e it's even worse, Mark, because if you use it in order to punish somebody who has engaged in discriminatory violence, that's being objected to. So we have this concept of hate crimes or bias crimes, it's controversial. But basically, if you can show that a victim was discriminatorily singled out because of a factor such as race, religion, or so forth, it can be treated as a more serious crime and receive a steeper punishment. So a recent example was Ahmaud Arbery, a black man who was assaulted and killed by several white people. And that had been successfully prosecuted as an assault and a homicide. But the, those who were seeking justice on his behalf wanted it to be prosecuted as a hate crime because of the message that it would send and the steeper punishment. How do you show a hate crime? How do you show that the victim was intentionally singled out because of discrimination, a major piece of evidence, and it was in that case, is that the assailant uses racial slurs. And that happened in that case. It was outcome determinative. A student of mine was interning for the hate crimes unit of a prosecutor's office in New York City over the summer. And in the training, this point was made that this is the kind of evidence that will help to establish that it was a hate crime. It is entitled to more severe punishment. And students objected. They said, you may not use that language. It's offensive. It's traumatizing. And guess what? It was retracted from the training. I kid you not. So, I mean, we are disabling government prosecutors from pursuing the full measure of justice against racial murder because of the squeamishness over the use of the language. I mean, there's a great scene from Monty Python's Life of Brian, where someone is being stoned to death for saying Jehovah. And the priest says, we should now stone him for saying Jehovah. And everyone starts stoning the priest because he uttered the word Jehovah, you know, and that's the sort of approach towards racial epithets to say, you're not allowed to say the word ever. Just the mere mention of the word is a reason for you to be canceled or punished. As Thank opposed you to for reminding the me of that. It's so on point, but you know, humor is no exception for those who are just absolutely, you know, categorically rigid about these matters. So it's interesting to me about the rigidity in it. It reduces our level of intellectual discussion to a kindergarten room where there's a certain words that you don't say, and that seems to be people's attitude towards things. But if you think about more sophisticated ways of dealing with speech, you know, we're not really in the ambit all the time of the state governing speech. Often what we have are these big social media networks and they can employ real human beings to police some of the speech, but often it's dealt with through an algorithm. And the algorithms I imagine are more sophisticated than did you use the banned word? They're going to try and get some sense of context. And this raises a couple of questions. So the one is, given that you're not dealing with the state, given that you're dealing with a private body, should the rules that they have for governing speech be different from the First Amendment? And that could be that they're more generous or less generous. And should we be using these kind of AI systems to police speech? Very complicated, difficult, important questions because the name of the game in terms of free speech or lack of free speech as a practical matter lies in the hands of these tech giants. 
Yes, there are too many oppressive government restrictions all over the world, but as a matter of scale, they are just absolutely dwarfed by the degree of censorship that's going on on the part of these companies. As you rightly stress, Mark, at least in the United States, the First Amendment free speech guarantee only protects against government action. Uh, private sector actors, including the most powerful media companies in the world, not only don't have to respect their users' free speech rights, moreover, they have their own free speech rights, which include the editorial discretion, just as you exercise in your great podcast to decide whom to host and whom not to host. As a civil libertarian, I'm very nervous about any suggestion to have government step in and police the content moderation decisions of these private sector entities. I guess overall, I'm more distrustful of government. Jason, you and I have that in common, I assume, than I am of even the most powerful private sector entities. As a cyber libertarian, my ideal would be that we would have such a multiplicity of choices among social media and other tech platforms that each of us as a user could find at least one that would be congenial to our own tastes. So there would be one that would support free speech to the maximum. I was very excited about the possibility with this in mind of Elon Musk taking over Twitter in which he said that he would enforce content moderation standards that overlapped with the First Amendment. I think that should be an option. Uh, and it's not an option on any of the platforms now. But I also think it would be wonderful for people to have all kinds of other options. I happen to dislike gore and violence, so I think it should be constitutionally protected, but I wouldn't mind having the option of filtering that out of my on online usages and, and so forth. So any policy that would, including antitrust policies that could encourage a multiplicity of options and, and user and, and to facilitate user choice and user empowerment, I would be in favor of. I'm a much more leery of a lot of proposals that we're getting, interestingly, across the ideological spectrum, including even some libertarian uh, professors and economists are saying, well, maybe we ought to have these tech platforms regulated as public utilities or public accommodations or common carriers. I just think of the, you know, bad experiences we've had in the United States with past such models, including the fairness doctrine for broadcasting. It sounds so nice and good. Who can be against fairness? But not surprisingly, every single presidential administration enforced the discretionary standards in ways that were favorable to their own political beliefs and political parties. And if you look at the discussions going on in the United States, it's not surprising that, you know, the Democrats want the social media companies and are pressuring the social media companies to punish as disinformation or misinformation any critique of their policies, right, or of their views about really important contested matters ranging from electoral outcomes to COVID health policies and, you know, the Republicans likewise. So I think it's a question of whom do you distrust more here? And I'd rather hope that a free market economically would ultimately produce a free marketplace of ideas where we'd have a range of options. Then would you... Going back to our discussion earlier, would you apply the same model to universities or to colleges? So if in the case of social media, you want sort of a free market of different levels of speech censorship or idea censorship, like gore or violence, for example, why shouldn't colleges be able to do the same thing? So some colleges, let's say, are highly permissive of what can be spoken on the college, whereas others are less permissive. And then students mm -hmm. and college professors would be able to sort of float in that free market and decide where they want to go. I agree with that with one very big exception, Jason, and that is that the many colleges and universities that are public, i.e. government entities, are bound by the First Amendment. And they're very important sectors of society where those First Amendment values are particularly essential as being conducive to the pursuit of truth and education, which is the special function of a university. But for private sector educational institutions, I would absolutely defend their First Amendment rights to, in terms of freedom of association and religious free exercise, because many of them are religiously affiliated, to choose to define themselves 
as providing less protection for certain ideas or certain perspectives, but they would have to be transparent about that uh, so that any student or any faculty member who went there made a fully informed and voluntary choice that they are going to have certain constraints. I think it would obviously affect the credibility of any research that came out of such universities, but if that's the choice they want to make, more power to them. As a, as a factual matter in the United States, the vast majority of private higher educational institutions have voluntarily chosen to adhere to First Amendment standards as a matter of their pedagogical concerns and their research concerns. But there are exceptions, and they are, by and large, religiously affiliated who say that they are going to impose certain limits on what may be said and what may be researched as it intersects with certain religious beliefs. And I defend that choice under, you know, the free exercise clause as well as the free speech clause of the First Amendment. So there's an interesting problem that can arise in a free market, which is that those who advocate for free speech have a much harder time than those who advocate for protecting people's feelings. So yes, exactly. if you're the person who's saying, let the Nazis wave their swastika and wear their leather jackboots, some people are going to acknowledge that you're doing this for an abstract principle. And some people think abstract principles are worth protecting. A certain kind of lawyer is going to be in that direction. Other people are going to say, this is so callous. These people are, you know, marching in front of Holocaust survivors that how dare you want to protect these people? Think about the feelings, the emotions, the safety, the security on the other side. And so if you have this open marketplace where some places are going to be safe space universities and some places are going to be free speech universities, what you might have is that most people drift towards the molly coddled university. They say, you know what, actually, it's quite nice to to live without having to deal with these difficult ideas that make me feel uncomfortable. I just want to mm -hmm. be in my warm cocoon and my university is going to have mm -hmm. a nice playpen mm -hmm. for me. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll have a lazy river. Many of your universities mm -hmm. spend their money not on, on books, but on other kinds of attractions. And so we could have this undermining of the importance of this diversity of values. I often think about the book Fahrenheit 451 you know, and this idea that firemen in that book aren't there to put out fires, they're there to burn books. And mm. when reading the book, you sort of assume this must be the usual totalitarian narrative of a pernicious state. And the punchline is that it comes from each other, that the purpose of it was to protect people from hearing these awful words. And the, there's a wonderful line that says, it starts with a word. Just can't we just take out this one word? It's rather offensive and it makes people feel uncomfortable. People say, yes, of course we can. No problem. That makes sense. And then that word becomes a sentence, becomes a paragraph, becomes a book, becomes a whole library. And the book specifically talks about, and the book's written in the 50s, that in order to cater towards minority group preferences, that you wind up censoring everything. And I think some people are capable of seeing the second order effects of censorship. They see things like what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You're setting precedents that this will have ramifications in places you don't like. And other people can't see beyond the edge of their nose. It's so the just go, I don't like how this makes me feel banned. You know, Mark, this is a constant problem with respect to not only free speech, but all civil liberties. When you think about it, by definition, we're always talking about rights of minority groups, because if you are a member of the majority, it's very unlikely that your rights are going to be subject to suppression. You know, in a democracy, it makes sense that elected officials would be responsive to the will of the majority. We expect them to do so, but that's precisely why we needed the Bill of Rights to be sure that there are some rights that no majority, no matter how large, can take away from any minority, no matter how small. But that leads to the educational challenge or advocacy challenge that, that you laid out so well which is we have to get people to look beyond the facts of the specific case, not necessarily to understand the abstract principle. I think it's harder for people to grapple with those. But what I find usually helps, and I've even done it in this interview already, is to give concrete examples of the opposite. And the United States being such a large and diverse country, for better or worse, I can always give examples that 
will be troubling to whomever I am speaking to. And since you were kind enough to read my book about pornography, you'll recognize I did the same thing. I have some illustrations in the book, examples of what would qualify as illegal pornography under the radical feminist definition. And I tried to have an example that no matter what your political or religious or ideological or other beliefs were, there'd be at least one example that you would look at and say, but that shouldn't be censored. So I think that, you know, telling a story, giving an example, you're a, a successful, effective lawyer. So you no doubt do this in your own advocacy in that capacity. But I agree with you, we have to get beyond the abstraction. So in your latest book on hate speech, you say that there are alternatives to censorship. Can you set that out for us? What should we be doing instead of stopping speech? So using hate speech as an example, people who are expert in countering hatred, promoting equality and inclusivity, diversity, dignity, organizations such as the Anti-Defamation League, the Southern Poverty Law Center, many others, they strongly advocate, I'll use for lack of a better term, counter speech. I don't think it's the best term, but the Supreme Court has often said that if you disagree with speech or you loathe it, or you feel that it has a bad tendency, the best answer is not to suppress it, but to counter it, answer it back. Counter speech has somewhat misleading connotations because it sounds defensive. And the robust concept of using your speech affirmatively to counter, to preempt discriminatory ideas is much more proactive, right? So I think education is actually a better term that, and these organizations do that constantly educating, you know, the Holocaust did happen and here are the consequences of hateful ideas and here are the benefits of the equality, but not doing it in a preachy way, going back to the prior point, you know, giving concrete examples of actual human beings that you can resonate with no matter who you are. And interestingly enough, beyond the United States, where arguably these kinds of efforts are required under the First Amendment in most cases, as I was doing the research for my book about hate speech, I was very encouraged to see that so many human rights activists from many countries all over the world that do not have a constitutional ban against suppressing hate speech, nonetheless, still oppose that as a strategy, concluding that counter speech and education and information was much more effective at broadening people's minds, increasing their tolerance, and making them pro-supportive DEI goals and anti-racist efforts. And I give many specific examples in my book. You know, they can, you've used humor in a couple points here, Mark. Humor is a great tool. Satire is a great tool. Role-playing, the list goes on. And interestingly enough, you, you mentioned algorithms before. I think I didn't answer that part of your question. Algorithms, as with all tools can be used for good or ill. And one of the uh, at least potentially positive uses is there are many social scientists and data scientists now who are using algorithms to study what are the most effective forms of counter speech online, you know, and they can be very granular as you've indicated not only substantively what the message should be, but what the tone should be, who the ideal speaker and interlocutor would be and so forth. What's your response to the idea that we should change our rules on speech in cases of an emergency? So during the pandemic, the view was, look, ordinarily the way that you counter disinformation is through more information that you can flag exactly. things and say, well, let me direct you over here and you can find out more. But this is different. This is the apocalypse. People are saying that you shouldn't take vaccines, that you shouldn't wear masks, that COVID was, you know, came out of a Chinese lab, all that stuff, disinformation, we need to ban it. And it's not sufficient to just sort of have a warning label app that says redirect elsewhere. We've got a crisis on our hands. So we should just stop the speech. We shouldn't allow people to utter that stuff. We should ban their accounts. We should drive them off into the dark place, the internet where nobody will look. Isn't that the best way to save lives? You've got millions of lives on the line. People are dying. And you callous free speech defenders, you know, want to allow people to spread their terrible lies. I know you're a brilliant advocate, but you didn't persuade me, counsel. 
<laughs> and I think you had your tongue somewhat in your cheek because you were giving examples of so-called disinformation that we now know I had more than a grain of truth in them. So if what we're truly interested in and committed to is protecting health, that is precisely the reason why, consistent with the scientific method in general, everything has to be subject to questioning, to challenging, to, you know, verifiability or falsifiability. And if we close off certain avenues of investigation, that's not only going to be bad for free speech, it's going to be bad for individual health and for public health. Now, since you mentioned the emergency, the devil is in the details. And if we are talking about a true emergency, and government, which still bears the burden of proof, right? Because the presumption is in favor of liberty against government power. But if the government can demonstrate that a particular restriction is necessary and the least restrictive alternative, i.e. least restrictive of individual liberty, in order to advance a countervailing goal of compelling importance, which public health certainly is, then, but only then, will that particular restriction be upheld, but only as long as it is strictly necessary. And, um, but that is very different from this general sweeping concept of we have a public health emergency and therefore anything goes. I mean, it's very easy for, and the test that I laid out, by the way, in U.S. law is called strict scrutiny. It applies to not only free speech, but other fundamental rights which is none of our rights is absolute. Jason, the difference, I guess, between our system and yours, but they, any restriction on right is presumptively unconstitutional, but government has an opportunity, which is usually hypothetical, but it could hypothetically, and in particular cases, it has satisfied this appropriately heavy burden of proof of showing both that the measure is designed to promote a goal of compelling importance, and number two, that the measure is narrowly tailored and necessary and the least restrictive alternative. Well, it's always easy for government to satisfy the first prong. Of course, it always asserts that it's got some compelling importance, whether it's public safety, public health, children's welfare, et cetera. But where the rubber hits the road and where the government usually fails appropriately is showing that this measure is even effective in advancing the goal, let alone necessary and the least restrictive alternative. Yeah, it's quite hard to think of good cases where both conditions would be met. I was trying to think of a hypothetical. In South Africa, we have quite severe xenophobia. So every few years it bubbles over and people from elsewhere are burned alive. They're burned in the streets. It's not constant, but it happens every so often. You might want to say that during times like that, the state would want to stop xenophobic speech. I'm not sure. I was thinking of a hypothetical case where suppose that the hatred of redhead people went completely mm. overboard and that mm. there was just spurred on by some South Park episode. There was just this enorm, everyone despised redhead. And at the, it was, you know, the, it became a situation where it was just a light of a match and the hot, everyone would just go out and kill redheaded people. Sometimes that situation does occur through government negligence. I mean, that happened in in Charlottesville in the U.S. in 2017 as a nonpartisan report that was commissioned by the city government after the fact tragically showed law enforcement was completely unprepared, didn't communicate or coordinate with each other. They weren't even on the same radio signal. They weren't patrolling the areas where demonstrators were attacked by car. And in that kind of situation, in fact, an emergency was declared, which violated the free, you know, presumptive free speech rights of both demonstrators and counter demonstrators. But sadly, it was necessary because law enforcement, which should have been the least speech restrictive alternative, simply failed.